welcome everybody. Um, my name is Judy Utah. I'm the president of the Orange County Asperger's Support Group. If this is your first time coming here, welcome. Even if this is your hundredth time coming, welcome. Uh, Orange County Asperger's Support Group is a nonprofit that's focused on helping individuals and families dealing with high functioning autism, Asperger's, PDD, NOS. We're primarily focused on teens and adults. And uh, we do that through three basic things. We have um, support group meetings and we have a variety of different support group meetings for different um, cohorts. We have social activities and then we have educational meetings like tonight. So um, I'm gonna in a second share some of our upcoming events, but I just wanted to welcome you here. Our focus today is on neurodiversity at work and we have a really great group of speakers um, who you'll get to know better tonight. So I'm really looking forward to this evening. Um, the session will be recorded and I will send a link to the recording once it's edited. So you will receive that. Also, um, our presenters were kind enough to send me the slides ahead of time. And Robin, are you out there? Yes, I am. Okay, Robin, if you could share the link to the presentation, oh. that would be great. Judy, okay. I can't share my slides. I can't give them away. Oh, you can't. I can't. There's a bunch of stuff in the comments I didn't take out for this presentation that's not appropriate. It, the speaker's notes aren't there. It would just be the slides themselves. That's fine. Then as long as the speaker notes aren't there. No, no speaker notes. Okay. <laughs> not to worry. Okay. I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. If we seem really casual, that's because Tiffany, Jessica, and I have been working together on this particular issue for going on four years now, if not longer. And so we have been partners in all sorts of meetings right from the get-go. So that's why if we seem very casual and comfortable, it's because we are. Um, <laughs> wanted to go over some of our upcoming activities. So this is, um, we, like I said, three things, support, social activities, and education. So I want to share upcoming activities. For those that aren't, aren't members, our membership is $20 a year for a family of four. I mean, you can't beat it. It's about as cheap as going to McDonald's one time. So, uh, uh, so some of these activities are members only activities, but it's very easy to become a member. Uh, we have a teen outing, which is we're going hiking up in the Irvine um, Regional Park up Jamboree. Then we have a game night for adults on Saturday night. Um, then we have a virtual support meeting. We have two different groups that meet, parents meet and then adults meet. We have an adult hike in the same location on Saturday the 30th, and then a team game night. Uh, we have a relationship with Dr. Alex Gantman, who's a psychologist that specializes in working with um, individuals and families uh, dealing with autism. He was one of the co-investigators of the Adult Peers Program from UCLA. And um, in beginning of May, he will be doing a parents a workshop uh, we are offering for the second year a scholarship of $500 to uh, a senior in high school. So it could be someone entering their senior year in high school or just graduating. And it's a $500 scholarship and it's not based on who has the best GPA. It's really based on what kinds of issues have you had to overcome and how do you show kindness to others. So two attributes that were characteristic of Jameson. We have a relationship with the Chance Theater in Anaheim. And for, I think, the fifth year, they are going to be hosting Spectrum Speak Up or Speak Up Spectrum. This is a summer program for teens. And it's a theater program. You learn, the learn about the theater. You play theater games. You get to make friends. And then at the conclusion, you actually put together your own show and perform it. It's a really, really wonderful program. And we're one of the sponsors of this program. And as such, 
those teens who do choose to participate or are selected to participate um, do so without paying any fees. And on the May 11th, around the same time, we're gonna have Karen O'Hanlon, who's their educational director and the person who's been running Spectrum Speak Up for the last uh, five years. She's going to be um, having an informational meeting uh, over Zoom. For almost 10 years now, I've been running a Toastmasters Gavel Club. This is a Toastmasters Club for adults, and it's a great opportunity for learning public speaking, making friends, you know, inc increasing and improving your a sense of self. So um, this is on Saturday, um, once a month, second Saturday of the month at 9.30 in the morning over Zoom. Um, our educational meeting in May is going to be on autism and technology. This is more about uh, technology tools out there to help uh, individuals on their journey. Um, I mentioned that we have support meetings. Uh, and I talked about the parent support meeting and the general support meeting. We started one for partners, and this is um, hosted by uh, Keila Parkinson, who's an author of a book on relationships. And so this is for people who are in relationships for their spouse or significant other. Then we have a second Dr. Gantman session this month, um, and this one is for adults. Again, the virtual support meeting. And then late in May on the 26th, we have Jeremy Hamburg, who uh, has been helping people with their dating and relationships. And he will be giving a talk on the five steps to dating and social success. What we do is by attending this meeting, you're on our mailing list. Um, and so on the first of the month, we will be mailing out uh, all sorts of details on these events and other things. Um, most of, many of these events are free, but some of these events, uh, there is an activity fee. It's usually around $20 at most. So um, that's just FYI for your information. This just came in as an email to me today. So I'm involved with workforce development and as such, my mailbox gets full every single day. Um, but this was a notification about California's unemployment rate dropping to 4.9%, which is great for California and actually makes it a good opportunity for all of you to find employment. But the problem that we're dealing with and that we're gonna be talking about today is really, even with this low unemployment rate, unemployment or underemployment for people with um, autism is still around 85% nationally. And so the focus of this meeting really is to help us bring that number down and align it with the unemployment number of the state. This isn't the first time we've had this meeting. It's actually the third. And um, I wanted to just give you a little history lesson. All these presentations were recorded. So if there's something in here that seems particularly interesting to you, you can go back and, and listen to it or watch it. Uh, back in 2020, we had our first one uh, and Jessica was there and Tiffany was there. And we also had Rebecca Beam who at that point was with AutoCon. Um, we had Jimmy Lifton from a group called Real People where he was teaching skills in um, After Effects. And then we had Marcus Villa from New Vista Career Academy, which is a program that's still around today down in Orange County, where they work to help people develop um, their employment skills. They do internships. They have a very robust program. So if you're interested in it, you might want to watch this video. And then we had Jose Velasco, and I'd call him the godfather of autism at work. He really, he's with uh, SAP, which is a very, very large software company. And he was really one of the first organizers of an autism at work program at SAP. And we were lucky enough to have him come and give a wonderful presentation about autism at work Pro programs, how they do it at SAP. Um, then in 2022, we had some of the same speakers come, but we were joined by Neil Barnett, and he's an, a director of inclusion hiring at Microsoft, and he chairs what's called the Autism at Work Roundtable, 
which is where a whole bunch of other corporations, dozens of other corporations meet and talk about strategies and work together to improve hiring for people on the spectrum. And they've expanded it to neurodiversity to a broader uh, group of um, individuals. We also had Anthony Pal Palmieri and he was, he's a special ed teacher, but he also started a coffee house and a coffee roasting company called Able Coffee Roasters and they're in Huntington Beach and they hire people on the spectrum. So great, if you want a summer job, this would be a great place to go. Like I said, these are all available on our um, YouTube channel. So if you want information, um, Robin, maybe later we can put a link to uh, the, the document that shows all our recorded videos. So I'm going to kick this off and talk a little bit about employment. So there's really three key things for um, increasing employment for individuals on the spectrum. The first are you, the employees. So getting you ready for work is really a key issue, making sure that there's success on the job. The second group, I'll put go over to the other side, are the employers, really creating a network of caring employers in Orange County. I talked about all these Autism at Work programs. Most of those are not here. So that's why we need the, the third group, which are the business intermediaries, which uh, Jessica and with um, NeuroTalent Works and Tiffany with Grit and Flow are two of the best down here in Orange County and two of the most successful. And their role is to help prepare you and to help pre prepare employers. My focus on this area was driven by the members of the Orange County Asperger's Support Group. Back in 2018, we did a survey and the top concern of individuals in our group at that point was unemployment. Um, and about 60% of the people responding were having, were either underemployed or unemployed. Above, I, I show some things that we've done. Um, this year we ran Career Club with the help of Zabacon. I mentioned Rebecca Beam. She uh, is a CEO of Zabacon and it was a program for college graduates um, on the spectrum. And it was a program that was offered from seven, September to March. We had 16 participants of which 11 found employment or uh, were employed by the by the end. So it was a really successful program. We're planning on having our second cohort in September. But for those that are career club members who were part of the first group, we're going to have a continuing program that'll start in July. More details to come. We also have had every every year we've had a number of resource meetings introducing you to Department of Rehab or introducing you to, I mentioned New Vista Academy, or introducing you last month, we had one on entertainment and autism where there was a lot of different programs available. So we've really tried to introduce you to resources out there to help you. Uh, Jessica, Tiffany and I are part of the Transition Initiative, which is run by uh, Chapman University and the Thompson Policy Group. And, uh, Tiffany and I uh, co-chair the workforce development uh, subcommittee within that. And we work really hard working across the county on trying to increase the number of programs to help you find employment and the number of employers out there. And then finally, a key focus of the three of us has been our ND at Work OC. And that is a was called Autism at Work OC, but it's really a focused program on trying to increase the number of employ employers in Orange County. So what is the key? I have read lots of books. I have heard lots of talks. I have had lots of conversations on what does it take? And the answer is you. The answer is you, and it's about paying forward, okay? I, I do a lot of work for nothing, okay? Just for the joy of doing the work. You could do a little bit of work and not only help your child, 
or help, you know, but help the community. And really what I'm saying is if you work, you need to think about starting an autism or a neurodiversity at work program within your company. A couple years ago, we've been pushing for this and it's in every newsletter that I send out. And a couple of the individuals who raised interest are now getting close to being able to launch. And what we did was we asked people in the meeting to volunteer. They introduced Jessica and Tiffany to their company. And a lot of the hard work was done by Jeff, Jessica and Tiffany to help bring those companies on board. And what we're going to share today is a little bit of that. But you need to walk away with an action item. This isn't some, you know how hard you all work raising your kids or your kids grow, you know, going to school. It's really on all of us to make things happen in Orange County. It's not going to just happen with you sitting home and saying, Judy, my kid can't find work. The answer is, what have you done to help? And I'm being very, very serious here. If, if we all work hard, we can have 4.9% unemployment for individuals on the spectrum, but it's not gonna happen unless we're active. So really it's about you guys helping drive those programs. So today you're gonna hear more about what those programs look like. You're gonna learn more about Grit and Flow and Neural Talent Works and those business intermediaries who really help drive the education within those companies and help explain the benefits of hiring neurodiverse employees. So that's um, some of the key things. And you're gonna hear not only from them, but you're gonna hear from other parents like you who have been active. So Jessica's gonna, talk a bit about how you, if you are an individual with, on the spectrum who is looking for work, the kinds of things you can do to improve your situation. Then Jessica and Tiffany are gonna both talk about the role of the business intermediaries and what they can do to help. Jessica is gonna spend some time with Capital Group and a couple of parents with Mina and, and Kevin and have them discuss what they did at Capital Group. And then Tiffany has been working very closely with Penn Emblem in um, Riverside on a neurodiverse, a very, very successful neurodiverse hiring program. And so Gina from Penn Emblem is gonna be there talking with Tiffany about how they were able to implement this, their program and what kind of benefits they're seeing. And then finally, I'm gonna beat you over the head one last time to see how you can help. So that's what you're in for today. And I hope you, we're gonna move very fast. If you have questions, put them in the chat. At the end, we'll have time for a lot more questions. I'm going to move forward and I am gonna assign control to Jessica so she can move us forward. Okay, Jessica, it's all yours. Thank you, Judy. Um, and thank you everyone so much for spending your evening with us. We really appreciate it. Um, I know a lot of people have had long days, so appreciate you being here and spending the time with us. Um, I am executive director and co-founder of NeuroTalent Works. And as Judy mentioned, um, we are based in Los Angeles, but really serving the greater Southern California area. Um, and really across the country now, a lot has opened up for job opportunities. So we're really excited about that. Um, and so, let's see. Okay, perfect. So Judy asked me to share a bit about everyone who's on the call that is a job candidate. And we know that, you know, they're finding a job and finding what your career is can take a lot of different paths. And it's a journey, it's a really, um, it's a process. And we know that a lot of times applying for jobs and interviewing, it can be a really discouraging process. There's so many steps, so many things to consider. Being in a remote world, it's even harder. Um, and so just for you to know that our team is here to support you um, and we have some resources that we wanna share. So the career journey, there's really several steps um, in the journey. And the way we see it is, you know, the first step is really career discovery. How do you decide what's the right job for me? 
what job should I even apply for? Um, and that takes a lot of self-work and reflection. Um, and so we um, have a lot of resources and organizations that you can go to to talk to, to help you find what those good jobs and fit might be. So I'm gonna go through each step of the journey and then I'm gonna walk you through some resources and I'll send a link in the chat as well. The second step is really that job search. You know, where do I find a job? How do I find a job? How do I narrow my job search? So we'll share some job boards that you can go to there. Um, job applications, you know, we hear a lot of times, why am I not getting a response to my job application? How do I make myself more marketable? Um, the fourth is job interviews. Okay, so now I've put in my application, I'm doing interviews, but why am I not getting, you know, hits on my job? How do I prepare for an interview? How can I improve my interview and networking skills? Fifth is starting a job. So you landed a job, there's decisions. Do I disclose about my disability? If so, how do I do so? What are accommodations I should consider? How do I do my best work? What do I need to, to do well in my job and in my life? Um, and then career growth. Um, once you're in a job, maybe you want to grow up or grow in your career ladder. Um, and how do you advance your skills and things like that? So these are a lot of the questions we you know get asked. And I know we only have so much time to go through all of it today. But what I want to share with you all is, um, first of all, that you're not alone, that we are in this together. And there are a lot of resources that you can look at um, for all of those stages of the employment journey. So I'm going to put it into the chat um, on our website. And I'll just share really quickly. Um, sorry, Judy, I'm going to pause and share my screen really quickly. I just want to show everyone these resources that are on our page that address each one of those career steps and some resources to help you with it. So I'll talk about it. Oh, looks like I can't scroll. Um, or I might have frozen. Can you all hear me? We can hear you. We're not. Um, it says has started sharing screens sharing, but it hasn't appeared yet. Oh, OK. Oh, there we go. Is it moving now? Now it's now you're good. OK, great. So one of the first YouTube videos you'll see here is one that Tiffany and I actually did together on breaking down the interview. There's some really key interview questions that you'll often get asked in a job interview. And we break down that interview, those questions and how to prepare for them. So I really recommend going to watch that video. And then as you see here, each phase that I just described, career discovery, job search, um, et cetera. There's all these lists of resources that I really recommend you going to. Um, and mostly in the job search phase, you'll see job boards that you can go and, you know, find jobs from that are specifically recruiting neurodivergent and disabled talent. Um, and then other organizations like ours that are doing similar work. We're all here to do this work together. Um, and so those are all listed here as well. So just wanting to share these resources um, and so that you know what's out there. Okay, Judy, sorry, I'm gonna stop sharing if you can okay, bring Okay, let me share back. the screen again. Okay, just thank to... you. Sorry for all the uh, movement. No, it's okay, hold on, I gotta do this in the right order, so just a second. Okay. Thank you. And by the way, in the meantime, if anyone has questions, you know, please feel free to type them into the chat too. And if we don't get to them, um, we'll respond to you or circle back at the end as well. Okay, okay. I'm gonna Thank give you, you control again, just a sec. Perfect. There you go. So those are, you know, a lot of resources there to access. Um, but I did want to just highlight two things. You know, I, our team intakes talent um, job candidates. And there are two things that we really want to emphasize to job candidates um, that can make a really big difference. One is the look and feel of your resume. So these are just an example. I see a lot of resumes that look like this first one um, and some of the second where there's not as much detail 
there's good content, but not impact focused writing. Um, and so you can actually Google for a list of power verbs and you can really strengthen your resume that way. Um, and so what I would encourage is to really look at your resume and to see how you can really say about what you accomplished in these jobs um, or experience that you've had in the past. So not that you just did data entry, but what did the data entry enable for that company? Or, you know, did it enable accuracy and organization? Saying those things really helped to show what you accomplished in that experience. Um, and so that's one thing about resumes. And again, these are just high level um, tips. There are tools that you can use to make your resume stand out a little more from a look and feel. Um, so Canva, Enhanced CV, and even Microsoft Word has some really great templates. Then interview preparation. You know, the biggest tip that I can give is to prepare and to practice. Um, I tell all of our candidates, Google for a list of the most common asked interview questions, create a Word document, type your answers in, and think of an example when you showed those skill sets or the experience that you have. A lot of times in interviews, you'll get asked, tell me about a time when you did this. Having that document to prepare and then practice, practice, practice will make a big difference when you go into interviews. Um, so that, you know, training that Tiffany and I did together, we really recommend watching that video. Um, our team is starting to offer quarterly workshops on resume and interview skills. So um, if you sign up on our uh, website, then you will get invited to our trainings. And um, in this workshop, we have you bring a job description and your resume, and we really work through your resume and interview skills and interview preparation. Um, Grit and Flow, Tiffany's team, I know she can share more. They're also doing a series on trainings for job candidates and office hours. So there are a lot of resources that are here for you. Um, so just wanted to share those with you. And our team, you know, would love to meet you. So um, if you're interested to get in touch with us, if you are a job candidate that's ready, looking for a job, um, the best thing to do is to go to our website and complete our intake form, which I'll put into the chat shortly. And once you submit your resume to us, you'll be prompted to have a one hour meeting with our team member, my team member, Danielle. And you'll meet one on one with her to share about your career interests. We'll share some resources with you um, and just get to know you and what you're looking for. Then we invite you to come to the training that we just shared about the resume and interview skills. And we're also about to launch a training on self-advocacy, disclosure, and accommodations. We know that's a very complex decision to make of whether you want to disclose, how to disclose, even what accommodations would even be helpful. Um, and so that'll be coming in the next couple of months and then we'll be doing it quarterly. So um, you can look forward to that. And then if you are matched to a job with one of our employment partners, we'll reach out to you and we'll walk alongside you through the hiring process. Um, and then you'll always have our resources to access on our website. So um, if, you, if you're interested in looking or if your child is ready for employment, um, you know, we would love to meet them. So um, that was our segment uh, for job candidates. And um, I think what's unique and Tiffany and I do um, I think because we work with companies so often, we really get a sense of how candidates come to us and what businesses are really looking for. Um, and so if you come to ours or Tiffany's trainings, you know, know that a lot of our experience is from working directly with HR recruiters and hiring managers. Um, and so, you know, obviously I'm going to brag about both of our organizations and our trainings, um, but also know, you know, whether ours is a good fit or Tiffany's is a good fit, we're here for you and um, to support you in, in your career journeys. So the rest of the night is going to be really focused on what companies are doing um, and how Tiffany and I and our organizations can be helpful to you, um, to parents especially here who work at companies that might be thinking about starting um, a neurodiversity inclusion effort at their company um, or introducing us to businesses. We really always appreciate that as well. 
Um, and what we can share too is that California is really trying to take bolder steps. DOR is trying to make bigger steps to engage businesses in disability inclusion across the state of California. And California is really leading the way here. And we have a really great opportunity these next couple of years. Um, so we welcome you to join us in helping to do that um, and to really make employment opportunities available for our community and to do it right um, and to do it thoughtfully. So um, Judy asked us to share a bit about ourselves and this new term of workforce intermediaries, which you know Judy showed earlier, how we bridge the gap and help um, companies to hire from our community. So for our organization, you know, our mission is exactly that, bridging this gap, introducing companies to a gifted untapped talent pool, um, and really understanding how to build inclusive workplaces for neurodiversity, a diversity of minds. Um, so our programs, our organization has three core programs. The first is corporate readiness, which is all about um, promoting neurodiversity at the company, um, you know, offering training and um, we have organizations that bring us in to do, you know, like a lunch and learn series um, or DEI, diversity, equity and inclusion teams might have monthly meetings or topics and we can come in and talk about neurodiversity um, and ultimately really wanting to find the right teams, hiring managers um, to hire with us, to meet a new talent pool and to design an interview process and workplace practices that are more inclusive. So that's our corporate readiness program. Our second is talent readiness. So everything that I just shared about for job candidates, um, you know, we don't have like a lengthy six week, eight week training program. A lot of our partners do that. Um, resources, you know, they're on our resources page. And we would encourage that for anyone who really needs more time to discover what jobs you want um, and to really prepare. There's some really great programs out there that are on our site. Um, we are really here for that final mile when you're really applying aggressively to jobs and um, getting ready to interview and in that phase of employment and our training. And then our job matching. So when we have an employer that we're hiring for a job for, if you make match to it, we will match. Um, and for us, this is really about designing an interview process that allows candidates to actually showcase and demonstrate their skills for a job. Um, where the interview process traditionally is very reliant on verbal communication skills and how strong you are at selling yourself and convincing me why you're the best candidate through your words. So instead, we work with employers to design an interview process where candidates can showcase those skills. Um, and this is where the biggest aha moments come for our hiring managers and their teams, where they see very clearly how our candidates have exactly the skills that are needed to do this job. Um, and so a job that we're hiring for right now is an accounting role. And so candidates do, you know, two Excel activities and a bank reconciliation activity. Um, and so then candidates can really show their accounting knowledge for this job. Um, and a lot of companies are moving towards skills-based interviews, such as in IT jobs, you see it a lot for coding, cybersecurity. Um, and so, you know, that's something for candidates to prep for, but also for parents to know and what makes the biggest difference from a hiring standpoint. And then for us, it's not just about job placement, but growing careers and ongoing support um, for both the hiring manager and for our talent who's placed to make sure that, you know, it's sustained employment over time. Um, so this is a high level of who we are and what we do, and you'll hear a little bit more shortly. Um, so ways to engage for the parents that are here. Um, these are the steps we really encourage you to do, you know, identify the right hiring managers and departments. Um, and this could be full-time, part-time employment, internships, even contract roles. Um, there's a lot of opportunity. And um, bring us in to do neurodiversity training and education. Um, and, you know, a lot of parents that we work with also just help to navigate, like, let me just make an introduction to HR for you. Let me just, you know, you should meet this hiring manager. They'd be a great fit um, to pilot this with. And, you know, let us help you do that. And then, you know, this is a collaborative effort. So in companies, it does always 
take a collaborative effort of usually these departments and more HR, diversity and inclusion, even community relations and corporate social responsibility and employee resource groups. And so we bring them all together to really advance this. Um, so that's the ways to get engaged. And then lastly, I won't touch on this too much. Our service offerings is really in talent acquisition, running hiring programs with companies and doing it right, designing the interview process, sourcing talent, um, doing training for the teams and then the ongoing support. Then the middle is our neurodiversity trainings and workshops that we have, um, several topics here, and then strategic consulting, just any other things outside of those, how to build a public neurodiversity at work program, an accommodations request process, all of those other types of um, services that might be helpful as well. So that's just really high level. Um, who we are and what we do. And um, as I know, Tiffany's gonna share too, like we're both here to support you and um, to be with you on that journey and um, are excited to meet you and, and also just appreciate any introductions too, to, to businesses and um, people that you know who would really have a heart and the right um, intention to wanna do this with us. So thank you. I'm gonna hand over to okay. Tiffany. Yeah, and I'm going to give Tiffany um, control. Control her. Kidding. Control. <laughs> you have control now. We're I under have control. control. All right. Thanks, Jess, and thanks for all the the nice words. Um, my name's Dr. Tiffany Jameson. Oops, I got ahead of myself here. Um, I am the managing partner and founder of Britain Flow. Um, I am a parent, so my son um, was in the Irvine School District. I was autistic at two. And so I've lived that life. And when I found out about the unemployment rate, as you've all heard in the last two years, I was beside myself um, and was not okay with it. So here we are four years later, we have Grit and Flow. Um, we've been able to publish articles on why you need to um, embrace neurodiversity and embrace people to have DNI, e and i analytics that we're gonna need for reporting. Um, I have two LinkedIn learning classes, one on neurodiversity and one on ADHD. Um, and, you know, just been able to go around the world and really spread the uh, message about neurodiversity and how you need to embrace the whole person to have it. Um, so, Judy, I don't know if you could spotlight me instead of um, Oh, Jessica. I'm sorry. Oh, no. Let me do that. Thank you for, thank you for reminding me. Well, because I talk with my hands and you won't understand me. I don't, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, all right. So let's get into who we are. So and what we do. So we partner with our customers to guide them on creative, inclusive practices to embrace, support, and retain individuals. So where we're different from, you know, Jessica's group, the Decker Spectrum Works, is we actually don't have a group of candidates. We don't prepare the candidates to be ready for a job. We prepare the, prepare the company to be prepared to take the candidates, to create the environment for when they come in to interview, when they come in to onboard, that environment is neuro-inclusive, it's ready. And all the way through the entire life cycle of being at a job, that entire process is touched with the neurodiversity lens to allow companies to be successful um, hiring and supporting people who are neurodivergent. Um, so it's a little bit different of approach, um, but it gets kind of the same idea. As organizational psychologists, we take a research-based um, look at this. So. We look at neurodivergent, we look at disabled, when we look at practices that will benefit all employees. So we get rid of that, you know, what are they doing for me? What are we doing for this group? Let's do it for the females, let's do it for the colored. We wanna just write and create policies for the company that's gonna embrace everybody. So we stop kind of bucketing all the efforts. Um, and, you know, as organizational psychologists, everything we do is research-based. So, you know, we take the individual, we have lots of authentic conversations. So you have to be able to talk to people. We talk with people. We get into those conversations about, you know, why this is different to hire somebody who's neurodivergent, how it changes your workplace. We do research. We don't just guess. We do the research. We know how the story is going to end right now. So let's take a different direction and try something new. So we are one of the few companies um, in the United States that actually uses research to do their inclusion efforts. Um, so we share that research a lot, of course, with our partners 
um, like NeuroTalent works, but that to us is really important to see what's already been established out there. Um, we also make sure we include the voices we serve. So my team is neurodivergent. Um, they have a very loud voice in our group. Um, when we do trainings, they're always trained by somebody who's neurodivergent or somewhat neurodivergent, or I don't know how you want to call it. Like I'm kind of neurodivergent, uh, but we really work by making sure we have the voice of community in everything we do. We do this also by staying connected to groups internationally within the community to bring their voices, their opinions, and make sure we understand the topics that are being discussed. That way we can guide companies to make sure they're using the right language to make sure they're understanding really what's needed by the population. Um, so that's kind of how we operate. So there's a research that came out said, and we as parents, and if you are an individual who's autistic, you know this is true. It's one of the most complex, misunderstood and ignabic conditions in our modern world. So we know that. So if we can change the business to support this, you know, autism, and all the differences that come along with that from the way we socially interact and how we ex expect things from each other, we will change the world. So that's why by looking at diversity and inclusion through the lens of autism and neurodiversity, you can really, really solve a lot of the problems we're seeing. And it's pretty exciting. So that's why we kind of take that approach. So we have the framework, um, it's called turning intention into actions. So. This is kind of how we, we think, and this is my dissertation talking here, so I'm gonna get a little technical on you real quick. So you have your individual beliefs, you yourself. So let's just say you're the hiring manager of your company. And since you are, you're an HR person and you're in this meeting here today, you're a parent, or you are somebody who's impacted by autism, your individual beliefs are probably really different about people who are autistic being good workers and what they're capable of and their levels of um, being able to be successful in the workplace. If you haven't had any of that, or if you've had bad experiences, or you've had an experience of seeing somebody who's highly impacted in their ability to uh, maintain attention or their body or other things, you jump to stigmas of what that could be. So your individual beliefs really impact a lot of your intention to make a decision. Well, next thing you have your culture norms. In your organizations, it makes you feel like, is it okay for me to make this decision to hire somebody? So capital groups here, pet emblems here, they've made it okay in their organizations to hire somebody who's neurodivergent or disabled. They've made it okay to support and to take those extra steps. That's that social norm that's needed. But also you need the empowerment by the organization. You need the top down, which has happened at capital group and pet emblem saying, we support you. We're gonna support that. Of course, things might be a little bumpier here, but in the long run, it's gonna be better. And without all those three pieces coming together, you're not gonna turn that intention into behavior of hiring and supporting an employee. So we work at all three of those levels within an organization to turn those behaviors, those thoughts, that culture into one that will hire and support those who are neurodivergent and disabled. Um, I'm gonna go over our process for detail with um, Gina earlier, or I mean, excuse me, in a little bit. So I'm not gonna to spend too much time here, but we do kind of what we call four points. You gotta prepare the organization. You just can't drop somebody in there and say, yeah, you're hired. Go have some fun. Woo. It's a little bit more than that. The organization has to be ready to be there for the individual and to provide them what they need to make the process start day one, off and running, successful. You got to help them source talent. You got to support the process. So it's those day to day, once again, small conversations, and you have to make it normal. So right now, for example, Pen Emblem, after about 14, 15 months, we're kind of in the background here supporting them if they need help, but they got this. It's normal for them to hire differently. And that's what you want at the end. So we'll talk more about this, what we did at Penn Emblem. So I'm gonna jump through for time's sake um, and get through some of that. And we'll talk about all this great stuff. Um, okay, so when we call source differently, the biggest difference I think um, in just our approach is we don't have candidates in our um, organization that we provide, present to companies. We you know, introduced to re, re, um, Department of Rehabilitation or, or whatever it may be in that state because we work um, nationally. Um, we try to supply, you know, the jobs that we need filled to all the different online applicants. Um, here's a couple of them. Um, Neurodiversity at Work Employer Roundtable now has a database, um, and I know Penn Emblem is now part of that roundtable, so their jobs will be listed there. 
inclusively. And then also there's placement agencies that do a lot more work of preparing the individual like Zavicon Parallel and of course NeuroTalent Works that we work with. And then it's supporting the process. Just, I don't know if this is moving for you, slowest for you as for me, <laughs> but we coach workshops, webinars, all those things Jessica talked about that we can do to help support the individuals that are supporting the people who are working and then normalizing the effort. So we are going to talk more detail about this, but I want to make sure we are looking at time. So um, let's see. I, Go ahead and throw I, back think, we're, I think we're to, uh, to Jessica talking about yeah. um, capital groups. So I'm going to... Hey we were out of time. I was trying to do all that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, uh, Tiffany. We look forward to hearing back from you. And Jessica, let me, uh, you, you should now be in control. Okay, great. Thank you. And I'm going to introduce um, Kevin Young and Mina Chakalingam from Capital Group. If you could spotlight them and bring them up too, that would be wonderful. Um, okay, hold on. Thank you, Judy. All right, hi, Mina. Hello. Okay, and Kevin, awesome. All right, um, you're spotlighted now, so we all see you. And um, yeah, I mean, thank you so much for just joining us tonight to be here. Um, for everyone on the call, we'll spend about 20, 25 minutes um, with Kevin and Mina sharing their story about, um, you know, how they started a neurodiversity hiring program at their company and um, advice to give to other parents who may be thinking about it um, and insight of what they've learned as parents and professionals through um, doing this with us. And they were in your shoes, you know, several years ago too. So um, I'm really excited for them to be here. And, um, you know, please feel free to ask questions in the chat too as we go. We're going to keep this more of a casual dialogue and conversation. Um, and so what I'll start with is, yeah, I'll ask Kevin and Mina if you could both introduce yourself, um, both as professionals and as parents. Sure. Thank you, Jessica. Um, my name is Mina. I am a project manager specializing in change initiatives. That's my professional side of it. And personally, um, I'm mother to three um, children, and uh, I still call them children, but they're all teens. Uh, my special needs um, guy is Rohan, who has Angelman syndrome, and he's 18. Thank you. Off to you, Kevin. Hi, I'm Kevin Young. Um, I work in payroll. I'm a tax manager and I have three sons. Um, two are on the autism spectrum. And I think if you heard the expression, you met one person on spectrum, you met one person on spectrum. Well, that absolutely describes for both my boys. They have the same diagnosis, but they're very different. And so my oldest one is 27. He's on a spectrum. Um, and uh, I don't want to name the employer, but he works at the happiest place on earth. <laughs> My middle son is, neuro, is neurotypical, and my youngest, and he's age 25, and he's an accountant just like his dad, and my youngest is going to be graduated from high school. He's also on the spectrum. He's age 17. Wow. Awesome. Thank you. Big families, um, and both three. That's awesome. Um, and so could we, yeah, you know, there's so many questions that I think, so much information that I think everyone would love to would be able to hear about and gain from. Can you start with, you know, how how did the conversation start at Capital Group about launching an autism at work or neurodiversity disability hiring program? And I think Mina, if you want to start that story. Sure, sure. The conversation definitely did not start as starting a neurodiversity program. And I think that's the point I, I, I was uh, hoping to make in this answer. So um, we were at a happy hour from our team. It's a group of project managers. And I was simply expressing the fact that people with um, disabilities, 
generally have less opportunities and people with intellectual disabilities have even lesser opportunities. Um, and I was sharing how my son Rohan, you know, he's, he's um, on the severe side and I was expressing how he will never get to work in a company like Capital Group where we all work in a corporate environment. There's not much he can contribute to a corporate environment. That's, I was saying that. And then immediately my team members, that really struck with my team members and my manager said, well, let's bring Rohan in and let's have him experience Capital Group. We can find something for him to do. So, you know, I thought they were kidding, but long story short, there was a day planned and I brought Rohan in and I think uh, we just saw a glimpse of that picture um, there, Jessica. There, there he was, my team right behind me and um, each of them found something that Rohan could do in his um, functional level, like shredding, copying, printing. And of course we had someone help Rohan. Um, and this, this was a big success I shared with Rohan's classmates. And of course, everyone in that floor saw that and other teams wanted to do it because Something about that day and seeing Rohan come in and do all those activities made everyone want to be part of it. So then we expanded it to more kids and then we called it uh, special abilities interns and each team would sign up for like two hours. So this would be like a community event. We'll bring in um, the high school students from um, Irvine School District and we would pair one on one as volunteers from the interested team. And they would do simple activities like just to get the experience of um, sitting in the computer working and printing and going and picking up the report and giving it to somebody in the office. So those little things and this became a big hit um, in a, you know, and Kevin was part of that too. In fact, um, Kevin ran it in LAO office and this was in the Irvine office. Um, and it became such a such a big movement that there was so much demand. And um, in our, we have communities and special needs network is one of our communities. And this actually became one of the planned item for a year and we had budget allocated for this um, event. It it just started with that and then it moved, moved to become so big. And in that process, um, we made several connections and several individuals that um, came through and said that they were interested. And then, you know, that got Kevin and I talking and we were like, well, how do we take this forward? And then COVID hit, visitors weren't allowed, then everything went virtual. And I think that really put our focus on, okay, now we need to do something more concrete to really bring people inside. And, and that's really how it all started. Um, I don't know if you want me to go into the full detail of what we're doing as a program now, um, but let me continue since you're nodding. So, yeah. you know, with it, it took us almost two years, I want to say, from the time that we did this intern event to the time that we um, started making um, concrete progress. And, you know, we have the inclusive hiring approved as a program. In between in those two years, you know, Kevin and I strategized, we would, um, we would go meet with uh, officials at different levels, you know, we have our leaders in HR, DEI, and everyone was supportive. And it almost like somebody had to go and talk about this and everyone was supportive. It wasn't a problem convincing them that we needed a program. It's really more bringing them all together to say, how do we do this program and how do we do it thoughtfully so that it is not such a drastic change across the organization. A capital group has 8,000 associates and any program that you're starting for a company that big, you know, has to be taken in small phases. So after two years or so, we were able to actually get a pilot approved um, and, and now we have, uh, now we are looking at three positions that uh, we have opened up for this inclusive hiring. Thank you, Mina. Yes, and I know that, um, well, I'll let Kevin share about this more, um, but it started with, I mean, you all, I love the story of how it all began um, and how so many colleagues, you know, came around this um, and that there was already a special needs community and network within the organization. Um, and so Kevin, I know you're very involved in that or in that community within Capital. Could you talk a little bit more about that 
And Kevin um, was one of the first hiring managers to, was the first hiring manager to pilot. So Kevin, could you take us through that? You know, how did it start for you? And um, what were like the most important conversations you had as you got started on that journey to actual hiring? Yeah, thank you, Jessica. Um, I oversee an employee resource group in a company. We've been in existence for over six years, and it's our associates who have loved ones with special needs. Um, and we have over about 150 associates who are part of this employee resource group. And so uh, ranging from um, autism, ADHD to Down syndrome, but I would say half the group have uh, children who are on the spectrum. And so, you know, we kind of share common interests, common challenges, and common successes of raising children on the spectrum. But we realized that there was a gap. We really wanted to start to drive this to be inclusion in the workplace and go beyond just supporting our loved ones with special needs, but also figuring out how can we have um, neurodiversity as part of our DNI efforts. And so when you think about DNI, you think about race and gender. But we really want to include that invisible diversity, and that is neurodiversity, right? And we want to include that in the same breath as race and gender. And so we expanded our mission to include neurodiversity hiring. And um, just like Tiffany, um, you know, when you have a child with with on the spectrum, you become more passionate. And and I was so passionate in terms of how could we drive this in the company. And I came to a point I realized that. I just have to go beyond talking the talk and I have to walk the walk. <laughs> so I raised my hand and became the guinea pig and, and said, I want to do this. And so I want to include a neurodivergent in our candidate pool. And in order to do this, and I'm going to give a plug for NeuroTalent Works. And so as you just took commissions later on, <laughs> But we need, we need, a, you need an expert. You need a, an organization like NeuroTalent Works to help you not only to source the talent, but as Jessica mentioned, provide the neurodiversity training. But the most critical part is really tweaking the interview process. And what they did was they modified the questions so that it leveled the playing field. They modified the questions so that the neurodivergent candidates, they can show their strengths, right? And so, they made the typical behavioral questions that you typically ask, they made it more concrete. And so that way the candidates can shine and they can articulate their strengths during the interview. And so that's what we did. We engaged NeuroTalent Works. And let me just explain that we have an inclusive approach. We don't have like a dedicated program where we're only including neurodivergent candidates and we're gonna fill it, fill those positions with neurodivergent candidates. We had a new, inclusive approach, we had candidates who are neurodivergent as well as neurotypical. And in my case, the neurodivergent candidate, they won out. They were the best candidate for the job. So it was a fair and equitable process. So thank that's you. how it all started. Yes, thank you. Um, that is very helpful to know. And I heard, I think both you and Mina um, allude to the term we took an inclusive path toward for this journey. Can you define what that means and what the other path would have been for you to take in, in advancing this in the company? Yeah, um, I mean, I can get started and Kevin, um, please add more to it. So when we started the discussions with our leaders of the organization, um, it was clear that you know, us being um, an equal opportunity employer, uh, we wanted to keep um, that the, the spirit of the equal opportunity employer with all the efforts that we did. Now, when we started, I mean, I started with the Autism at Work playbook. There is a playbook that was put out and I'm a project manager by trade. So I started creating my business case using that playbook, right? So that was my goal to start an Autism at Work program. Our goal to start the Autism at Work program. And that's really what the business case was about. But as we were meeting with the business leaders, it became clear that um, as a company, we stood for that equal opportunity employment. Um, and so there was a point in time, it's like, okay, do we wait um, for the organization to get there to Autism Network, Work or do we meet them where they are and um, slowly progress or at least 
try that method out to see what the lessons learned are and if that points us in one direction or the other. So that's really how we came about making it inclusive and broader, open to both neurotypical and neurodiverse candidates. Um, so that's that's really how we did it. We just went, met them where they were, and we started working from there. Yeah, and, and thank you, Rita. One of the important things I want to mention is I want to ensure that my manager had the buy-in. I had her 100% support. I also wanted to make sure that my team um, would create a culture that would be accepting of someone who was neurodivergent. That's so important. And so my team was like a family and I knew ahead of time that they would be accepting, they would be patient. And a year later, um, my, my, my new hire celebrated this one year anniversary. My team has been very, very patient and understanding. And it's so key in terms of providing that psychological safety where the associate can feel comfortable. They could be able to say, here are my gaps. Here's what I need to work on. And my team was able to adapt and help them through those gaps. So again, it's, it's very important to find, the, to find the right team, to find the right, not only just the right job, but the right fit, the right culture fit, the right team environment. Yes, very much so. Thank you, Kevin. That is, it is so key to find the right leaders um, and that the right mindsets exist towards, you know, we hear a lot that in companies that have neurodiversity hiring and inclusive um, strategies, that the managers that are trained become managers, better managers for all of their people. It's expanding the toolkit for all types of minds and learning styles, which we all have. Um, and so I think that's huge. The other thing is, I know you might not brag about it, Mina, but you coming from a project, the project management, change management office, you have this structured approach that is taken to this too. And I think that rigor and discipline and structure for this makes a difference. Can you share a bit about the structure that's been put in place for these first pilots, um, the road shows, the, yeah, the whole format of how, how you're running it internally? and finding the right teams. Sure. As, as we, just like you mentioned, for any initiative that um, touches the culture of the organization, it's important to have um, key sponsors from different lines of business. So first we got the buy-in from the leaders of the organization, which is your HR, your DNI, your legal, uh, you get the buy-in from the top level. And then, from there, well, the top level isn't going to enforce, right? This is a, a grassroots organization and the top level says, we support you. And then it's still a matter of people raising their hands to say, yes, I want to be part of it. Now, Kevin was the first um, use case and I we used Kevin's um, learnings to create this playbook of what the interview process will look like, uh, what are the different steps that needs to be involved. Now we needed to go and find interested parties in different line of business. And even to enter a line of business, you need to have that sponsor at the leadership level to say, yes, I will take this to my business um, and get you in front of them. So, and that's where my contact uh, in the special abilities interns came in handy. I met with all those um, senior managers that gave the opportunity to do the special abilities interns to say, now we have an approved pilot and I know you have a passion for this. Would you be a sponsor for this effort for your uh, business area? For example, we have ITG, we have shareholder services. So it's having that discussion. And what's so great about it is it's like you start with the costs, you take the costs forward and then afterwards the cost takes on itself and people want to want to be part of this. So anyway, we identify sponsors in each line of business. And once we have a sponsor, we use, um, not we use, we leverage the sponsor to go in front of the teams to present, um, this is what it is. And we follow a structured approach and we have a plan. And we have done this before, which is thanks to Kevin. Um, and we have an established partner, which is Neurotalent Works. So we bring that to them to say, you know, the the leadership supports this and we have a structured way of doing this and that really brings the confidence to them. You know, without that 
structure, no matter how many times you have the conversation, you are not going to bring that confidence to people, which what happened in those two years where I had gone and spoken to each of these sponsors uh, who are now sponsors before, but at that time we didn't have an approved effort or initiative. So once that fell in place and the rest of the folks, it was easy for them to get on board. Now it's an approved effort and they can do something. About Thank you. Yes. And you shared something really profound with me, uh, Mina, and maybe this moves into that next question to both of you of, you know, what new perspectives have you gained since leading these efforts in your company? And also as a parent, what have you learned? Um, and Mina, you had said something really special to me when we were preparing about wanting to encourage parents that um, you only need to lead an initiative like this for so long. Can you share about that? And then Kevin to share too. Yeah, absolutely. So as I plan my um, structures and the work streams, um, I had a work stream for everybody. However, what came as a complete surprise was as I went on um, these roadshows and talked to these people and these uh, different teams, not just the hiring managers, there are others that, you know, that raised their hand to see, to say, I want to do something about it. What can I do? Um, even if they are not a hiring manager. And so they became these um, champions. We formed a whole work stream of champions to build awareness, which was not in my plan. And it was a very special bonus. And it was a very heart touching bonus. It, it's just that the cause uh, speaks for itself after a while. And once you start speaking, it touches people. There's always somebody they know. There's always someone in the family. There's always someone they have encountered. It, you just need to be that one to say that word and start the conversation, I feel like. Thank you. And again, I would say um, that uh, to all the parents, you know, be prepared for that five minute elevator speech in terms of why this is important, right? And, and you can you can pull that out of your back and say we need to do this, not just because it's the right thing to do, but it can, it can add value to our team. It can add value to our organization, because nurturers have a different way of thinking. They offer creativity, right? And so all the strengths that they can add to your team. And so be prepared to have that five minute speech as you can share with your coworkers uh, throughout your organization. So. Thank you. And we have about four minutes left. So I want to um, ask if, and I think maybe we'll leave Q&A till the end um, for everything that we're discussing tonight. But yeah, what advice would you give to other parents who are thinking about starting a program? Um, and what are the key things, you know, anything that you wish you knew before getting started also? Um, one thing I would tell parents is, is really don't wait to start when the, when everything is perfect. It's all about start small, start wherever you are, even if it is just having the conversation with people about, um, what it means to be a parent or a family member with a neurodiverse individual and uh, what are some of the challenges that you face, even if it is just the conversation that you can have. And, you know, that will take, that will take you further and bring interested parties or at least concerned parties together to talk through. And then maybe you will do something small as uh, an event or like a bring your um, child to work event that is geared towards neurodiverse individuals. And just to give an opportunity for them to even see what it is, because not many people have opportunity to interact with a neurodiverse individual. And in their mind, they always think the most severe side of things. And therefore, once you make an opportunity, that kind of breaks down that taboo a bit. And they're like, oh, you know, that because many people in the special abilities interns said that to me they're like wow I couldn't even tell you know that the the child I was paired with the individual I was paired with had um is neurodiverse it's it's just that aha moment that you're bringing to even one person goes a long way thank you and, um, and I have the luxury and the privilege of being a parent of two kids on the spectrum as well as being a manager Right. And so I would say that, um, you know, it's helped me be a better manager. 
I realized that parenting someone on the spectrum is way different than managing someone on the spectrum. <laughs> And so, but it's made me a better manager, but it also helped me prepare my youngest son in terms of how can I prepare him for the workforce, knowing what I've experienced as a manager. So what I'm doing with my son now is I'm helping work on his executive functioning skills, right? I'm working on, on problem solving. I'm helping him create task lists. I'm helping him work on his organizational skills because these are required for the job. And they don't teach you that on the job. You know, you're expected to have that from day one. So of experience I've learned as a manager, I'm just saying to my son so he can be successful in the workplace and I'm preparing him now for that, so. Well, thanks, Jessica. Yeah. Any yeah, last words you. from you? I was just gonna say, I think I really love that, Kevin. Um, there's so much wisdom that's gained and to pay forward and to teach back to this community and other parents. So just thank you both again so much for joining us tonight. Um, and we'll, yeah, we'll, if there's any other questions that come up. Um, I saw one that came up in the chat and then we can talk about it in the Q&A. But thank you both so much and for the amazing work you're doing um, for the community and as parents. And I would like to add that both Mina and I, um, we could forge our emails. We're open to any questions you have after this session. We're more, because we want to help your organization start this, so. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Kevin and Mina, fantastic. Jessica, I'm. I'm going to transition to Tiffany and let me spotlight Tiffany and Gina. Tiffany, where did Gina go? There you are. Trying to hide from you. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Hey, Gina. Hello, this is so good because what we did with at Pen Emblem was so different from what happened at Capital Group. So this will give um, everybody here, just a really great opportunity to see just different ways this can all play out. Um, so Pen Emblem is a manufacturer. Um, I'm not going to even do justice to all they do. So first, I want to introduce one of my partners in crime and one of the best supporters of this effort, uh, Miss Gina Ramirez. She is the plant manager. Gina has been at Pen Emblem for 30 years. So she started out as a graphic designer and has moved throughout the entire organization. Now she runs the entire plant that has up to 160 people at some point working there. Um, is a phenomenal problem solver, a amazing boss, a very conscientious woman and a great human being that I have just had the honor of working with. Um, she's made my life a better place. So I am I'm very blessed to have her um, as part of my, my inner circle now. Um, but I'm going to let Gina talk more about herself, but also just tell them what Penn does, because I can't do it justice. Okay. Well, Penn's been around for 75 years now this year. Um, it started with our current owner's grandfather. Um, we manufacture different types of products, um, anything from sublimated printing, uh, emblems, embroidered emblems, we do direct embroidery on garments. Um, we do sew on, on garments. So we may take an emblem that we've manufactured and sew that onto a cap or onto um, some sort of article garments, um, bags, things like that. Um, trying to think all the different problems. I mean, we, we're still all. doing <laughs> silk screening. We're still Don't doing silk screening. <laughs> I mean, all yes. your logo wear, I mean, you'll see, you know, your main teams. I can't say any of the teams, but yes, anything you, you can decorate. We do. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. You start like Jones and out when you're there like, hey, oh my God, they ripped them out. Um, and they make all the name badges you see everywhere. Um, and it's just so interesting, the badges they make, because they'll have so many colors. It's such an artwork seeing these machines go. Um, and the work that goes into, you know, programming and setting up the machines and knowing the thread colors and all the other things, um, it's just pretty darn cool. So yeah. um, Penn has three plants or three locations right now. Mira Loma, which is in Riverside County, is one plant, the, the one that Gina runs. Um, and they have their corporate headquarters um, and more of their R&D is in Pennsylvania and then another uh, manufacturing facility in Mexico. So I think about 500 people. Yes. 500 people. Between all three facilities, yes. So, um, Gina, yes. how did you guys get into inclusive hiring? <laughs> and, and, and just to point out that Penn Emblem <laughs> did not focus just on neurodivergence. They focused on 
really anybody who needed to be hired differently. So um, disab disabilities, neurodivergencies, um, reentry of the workforce, whatever it may be, they were open to any type of talent that was willing to go in. And so the practices we did apply to all of those. Yes. So we started um, with another group that and then in turn uh, came in and gave us the basics. Um, we had an on-site hiring person from this group. Um, then they actually introduced us to Grit and Flow, which really enabled us to really get going. Um, we started like the base with a, the other group, but Grit and Flow has helped us progress much faster, um, better. A lot of good training that we were not aware of, had no idea. Um, honestly, when this first came up, we were scared. Um, you know, what we hadn't heard of anything like this. So myself and the rest of the management team, it, it was new to us. So it did, you know, all those questions came up, what if or how or, so um, Tiffany and her team has helped us get moving and grow and hire a lot better for anyone and everyone. That's been the best part of it, I think, is seeing yes. Pen Emblem take everything that we've, you know, implemented, focused towards our inclusion hiring efforts, but it's become normalized throughout their whole organization. So um, their owner is ADHD, and she saw this program somewhere and jumped on it. And with her full support, they kind of threw it at um, Gina and her HR partner, who who are the leaders in this. Um, they didn't just identify roles like a lot of people do. They said, here are all our roles we need to fill. We have a need for talent. What can we do? So we worked with Pen Emblem to go through some of their higher need jobs. And um, Gina would go through and, and teach me the jobs in some ways and go through, we tore everything, the details. I would look at it through a neurodiversity disability lens and say, okay, is this fine motor? Is this gross motor? What kind of communication is needed? What kind of critical thinking is needed? How does it smell? How does it look? What is the noise? And go through all those things with that. And then we would kind of make an addendum to the job description, which define more of these things that would come into play for somebody who's maybe coming in from department of rehabilitation, um, or anywhere else, they were able to match candidates better that way. Um, so they were great about allowing us to go through all that. But then Penn Emblem opened up their doors for all of the Department of Rehabilitation to come in. And they had them do tours. And they said, everybody come in. And Gina would take people on. And then you did it for me when I first did these, these amazing tours and show them all the jobs, all the abilities of everything that everybody would do. Um, and I think it made such a big difference, Gina, that you did that. Um, so I don't know if you want to add about working with DOR at all. Yes, but also, and what we were able to do together was with the hiring process, it helped us hire better. Um, we learned about work-based interviews rather than just the regular interview questions. You know, in the beginning, I asked a few questions, um, regular interview questions, and in some cases I wouldn't get any response or limited response. So um, we worked together and we learned the work base interview, which helped. Um, as Tiffany mentioned, we went through the tours, we looked at each job individually and were able to, we created work base kits. So depending on the position, we went through and put the skills together that were needed for a particular position, put a packet together and would do that during the interview to help the hiring process and, and do much better for anyone and everyone. So the work-based interviews took like the core essential skills. So for some, they had a lot of fine motor skills, clippers or other things. Um, so Gina designed a couple different boxes with some of the, the more entry level jobs. And we were able to take a candidate through different jobs and find out which one, A, they were better at. So it could be the way of, you know, discerning the details or the fine motor or just their interest level. Um, they got to try it a little bit without, you know, if they didn't know something, we got to see how they asked questions if they had a question or if they didn't. If they didn't know how to do it, it wasn't such a big thing. It's did they have the emerging skill? And then we were at that point, you know, able to kind of see, okay, can they do this job? And then we looked at how are they gonna fit into this environment? So it wasn't about 
this big interview. How are you doing? Tell me about yourself. It was, hey, you want this job? Do you have these skills? You have these skills? Now let's talk about it. You fit in here. And that just took out a lot of the stress out of the whole job seeking process. But we did do something for Pen Emblem that they're doing now is we did what we call pre-screening. So we had a dedicated contact. We were able to get a department of rehabilitation for all the counties um, in the area. So it was everybody and they would all get funneled into us through one person. So we would get the, um, give them a pre-screen and the representative, it could be the different companies exceed or whomever they may be who are, are vendorized through DOR. Um, they would fill out kind of the pre-screen. We would set up a Zoom um, and we would just kind of get a feel for the individual, what kind of accommodations or adjustments they would need. We would get a feel for um, the type of interview we should probably put together, the type of job they might be willing to do, um, their communication preferences, um, and just kind of talk them through the process so they knew what to expect when they were coming in. Because we know, you know, a lot of times that first step through the door is the hardest. Um, and I know, we know we've had some times where we couldn't get people through the door. Um, so them taking that time to go through that. Um, I want to talk about Seth because I just think he was just this great process we went through and, and look at it now. Um, do you want to tell about Seth's very long process? <laughs> <laughs> well, Seth came in and didn't talk much. Um, I asked, he was one of my first interviews. So I asked him a few questions, um, and he left. Um, I know Tiffany had a conversation with him. We encouraged him to come back. We gave him a few days to think about what he had seen and so forth. But he came back and we went through again, took a, a walk around the plant again, and we found a spot that he enjoyed um, and he wanted to come to work right away. And he's been with us ever since. Um, he's here, dependable, always here, doesn't call out. Um, very anxious to, to get to his work and get it done. And he does a great job now. It, it was very interesting in the very beginning. <laughs> he was one of our first, so we learned together. But he's uh, very happy. We're very happy with his performance. And he's been with us from day one. So like Tiffany said, we're going on almost two years here now. So yeah, very well, successful. December, January 2021. 20. So about 14, 15 months. So they've hired about 50 people over this time. And there's about a 73% retention rate over that time, which is great. So another really cool thing about what Gina's done at Penn Emblem is you go walking through this, this the plant and there are people from the inclusion effort everywhere. You don't know who's who. You don't know who's what. You don't know anything going on. And they're just merged into 14 or 15 different roles. There's just one size doesn't fit all. They, we fit people where they needed to. Penn was so awesome about taking things and, and you know, um, that anxiety about starting a job or being able to go full time. Um, they were so wonderful about saying, you know what, let's start you part time. So we would start somebody part time, say, you know, Monday through Friday, they would go, you know, say eight to 12. It was very, um, and then after a couple of weeks or months, depending on the individual, we would add maybe one more hour a day. And then a couple we'd add more until finally they're full time, but allowed them the opportunity to adjust to the job and allowed people sometimes to adjust their medication to the time they were going to the job. Um, transportation, of course, has been a big issue with many of the candidates. They've been working as much as they possibly can, bending over backwards for their for their employees to make it work. Um, beyond probably what most employers would ever do. Um, they try to make it successful. So it's um, it's just been really neat. I, I think, um, let's talk about the managers and how they felt, Gina, you know, when we started doing this. Um, they well, kind of didn't freak out. They were really freaked out. <laughs> they all did, including myself. Like, what, what, okay. Um, so yes, but we did have a very candid conversation. Um, Tiffany came in and, you know, we're going to be honest with you, Tiffany, we're, we're a little scared. We don't know about this. We don't know about that. Um, and we learned, um, we would have, we call them our toolbox talks a couple of times a week. So we'd bring up particular situations that would come up or um, questions um, that would come up with the group and we'd solve the, 
solve that and work on it together with, you know, your help, of course, Tiffany. But it's been a learning experience for all of us. But beginning, yes, everyone was scared. Um, you know, what if someone does this, someone does that? Um, but but we we got through. We're, now it's like, I, and it's awesome. And and everybody feels good about everything every day. It's made a big culture change in our facility, for sure. I think some of the simplest things we really had to do is say, don't judge this. Yes. It's not about you getting what you need when this person walks in. They're not going to give you that feel good. I'm all about you. It's about, can they do the job? So leave all that at the door and don't judge. Are they doing the job? Are they communicating what they need? And that was, I think, hard. Um, it's hard for anybody. I think we naturally do that. But her team and her leaders were able to, to kind of like stop themselves from jumping to this conclusion that this person's not friendly, mean, or whatever it may be mm -hmm. yet, and say, okay, get to the job, the work-based interview, and get working with them. And then they were able to kind of break down those barriers and understand how they can add to it. Um, but the toolbox talks, you know, a lot of it was um, us coming in proactively because they wouldn't know, even know what to ask. Like, you know, you don't know what to ask, but you don't know that kind of thing. So we'd come in and start talking about working memory. We'd start talking about, okay, you see somebody, you tell them things are taking some time, what's going on in their head, processing speed, how that works, auditory, visual. If you say something an in instruction to somebody three times and they're not getting it, you're probably not giving it to them in the way they need it. So maybe you need to write it down. Maybe you need to make checklists. Maybe you need to try another way because not everybody learns the same way. And so we made it at Penn where it's always like, okay, do I need to make a checklist because it's not getting in? Do I need to give them some more notes? Do I need to send them home with something to practice? Um, I mean, we just, we even had one gentleman who had to do a lot of math um, for his job. And it was as simple as saying, let's go get him a multiplication sheet and use that and put that on his workstation. So he didn't have to spend all his time doing the calculator. He could go down and across and know how many emblems he had to get. Um, there were so, so many simple things they were able to figure out just by having these conversations. Um, and then my favorite was the stimming. We have a, um, a young lady who likes to sing and dance and kind of it's a little bit animated at times. <laughs> and at the beginning that, um, we had to tell everybody, okay, is it endangering her? And they'd be like, well, no. Is it endangering you or anybody around you? No. Is it keeping them from doing their work? No. Is it keeping you from being able to do your work? No. Is it just weird? Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, just weird we're gonna let slide, but if it starts getting to any of these other categories where it's disruptive or something else or it's harmful, then we need to be concerned. But if it's just a matter, you can't figure out why somebody's so comfortable maybe singing them themselves or doing a couple of pirouettes while they walk over to, you know, <laughs> to the next day. That's not so bad. But, you know, you do have to put that balance in, which I think is another important thing, Gina, is when, when you got to say no, when you got to say it's not going to fit or this person doesn't work out. How, yes. how, how has that journey been for you? Uh, challenging challenging but um we try to work with the individual um one of the things like you were mentioning is asking them you know we're talking about the different ways they learn is in the, the initial interview or in the conversations that we're having tell us best how you learn and that technique has helped us with everyone um but and and with some of the challenges that we've had we're we kind of, we have to have the conversation. You know, this is, this is, this is being a little bit, um, what's the word I want? Sorry. Unprofessional? Disru unprofessional, oh. maybe getting a little disruptive. So, you know, we have to have the, the conversation and explain why, or sometimes show why. Um, and, it, you know, continues. We, sometimes we have to reach out to Tiffany and her group. How can, you know, how can we work with this challenge? Um, but we usually manage to, to make things work. And it, it's honestly by just having the honest conversation with the individual and being as open and honest about what's going on. 
you know, I think the, one of the main things we talked about when we got there is they're human beings, everybody, mm -hmm. just human beings. If they just are kind of coming at it differently. So don't think of it as being different. Be honest, be real, set yes. high expectations. Don't not treat them like you would any other boy. They're accountable here to you mm -hmm. to work, to do this job. When we say reasonable adjustments, reasonable accommodations or how you work best, that's giving them the power to do the best job they can for you. But this doesn't mean they get to walk all over you and take advantage of it. And sometimes that was the case. You know, we had individuals that come in and they've had this life where everybody always kind of let them out early, easy, let them off easy yeah. because of whatever path they've taken. And they, we weren't letting them off. They were accountable. So um, mm -hmm. it was a little bit, it was great. It just comes, it was a little bit shocking sometimes for some of the parents, <laughs> um, some of the job coach agencies. Um, actually, I want to talk about job coaches. So what was your initial experience with job coaches and then how has that progressed? Oh, that was a good one. <laughs> In the very beginning, um, again, challenging, um, but it had to do with communication again and what we expected. You know, some would just come in and just hang out, just not um, working with the lead or supervisor on the position, not communicating uh, challenges that the individual may have been having. So um, us being proactive and, and going to the coach, you know, hello, um, checking in. We had to go through that whole, you know, coach process in the beginning. They'd just come in and go and do whatever they were doing, but develop a whole process of check-in, um, what our expectations were, follow-ups, um, meeting with them and, and the client together. Um, and, and that's progressed. So now the agencies know what we expect when they do send in a coach. And if we find uh, a coach that isn't meeting, you know, the expectations, then we have that conversation with the agencies to make sure we, we have high expectations of the coaches that you bring in to make sure your clients are successful. We want everyone to be successful. And, you know, when it comes to level supports needed, it's been everything. It's been, you know, transition to now not having any coming in. Um, there really isn't a level or anything that, that's been recruited here. I mean, we got office work, we got complex embroidery machines, we got simple things. I mean, there, there really is no bucket here that anybody's put in, but some of the job coaches agencies, we know we have a job coach who's getting paid, you know, minimum wage, who's overseeing someone who's getting paid more than them. They don't know what they're doing. They, they, they don't have the knowledge of that job. Sometimes they get thrown in it. They don't even know the candidate or the, the hire they're with. Mm -hmm. So, we were really disappointed in that a lot. So we worked with the agencies and said, they need to check in. They need to check in with their, the lead when they come in. They need to know the dress code here too. This is a manufacturing, we have safety standards. They need to be behind the job lead, the leader and telling them what they can do to support the employee because the coach isn't gonna be there forever. So the whole idea between every everything we did with Pen Emblem was to make any of the coaching, any of us, like not needed anymore. So the coaches were behind the leaders helping them out. And then if they needed to do a little bit more, then of course they would be there with the employee, depending what it is. But it created the empower for the leaders to lead and to know how to manage their employees. So it also created more of an inclusive environment. Um, so that's, I think that was pretty cool, but it was, you know, a process of going through. Mm -hmm. um, what other big things do you think that the group should know about? We have about eight minutes. Um, let's see. Think, no, thinking. Probably just, um, like I mentioned before, just be open and honest about everything and anything. Um, don't try to, hide behind any type of stereotypes or anything. Just say things the way they are, be open and honest when you're, when you're communicating with uh, employers, um, with individuals and put it out on the table. I think is, is probably the best thing. It, you know, in the beginning we tried, you know, we didn't know, we were fearful. We, we just, we didn't know. So we were kind of sidestepping some questions and things like that. But I, I found the best way is just to be open and honest about everything. Tiffany, can I interject a question for Gina? Gina of course. Fantastic information. Just two questions. One, 
you talked about cultural changes to your environment. Yes. And can you share how things have changed since you've changed your hiring practices? Yes. Um, as we started getting more individuals into our facility, we found our employees would open up more about um, individuals in their family that uh, may have had a neurodiversity in their family and so forth. So we found that our employees started to get really, um, I don't know if I want to say protective is, is the word I want, but they really wanted to jump in and help uh, everyone and anyone that came in. So it was just a change. I've been there 30 years. A lot of the, the individuals there have been there, you know, 15, 20 years. And some of them at some point kind of felt I want to say like territorial, this is my home, this is my place and so forth. And that totally changed as we started bringing more um, people into the facility. So now it's more family, we're, we're like a big giant happy family. So it's changed a lot. And, and besides the cultural, what we always get asked, Tiffany and Jessica will, will comment on this. We always get asked, what's the business case? What's the value that, you know, the productivity? Any kind of anecdotal or, or benefit that you've seen to Pen Emblem as an organization besides the cultural change? Yes, I have great individuals that come to work every day. They're dependable. They do the job. They're successful at it. Um, makes us successful and productive, and we're happy on both sides. Happy with the employee, happy customers. So it's been a great experience. You know, we've had to, you know, there's not always a, everybody's so excited about this at all levels in the organization. So we, mm -hmm. we did have to show some return on um, investment. So what we learned is that um, we call it inclusion, inclusion employees. Inclusion employees don't necessarily meet their productivity goals as quickly as somebody who doesn't come in through an inclusion effort. Um, they meet them, but they get there slowly. But what we found is that when they get there, they stay at the company longer. So your retention's longer. So even though you have somebody got whoop, real quick up to meeting their productivity, you lost that person because they didn't stay at the company and you had to start all over again. So you have this nice steady individual who took a little bit more time, but they stayed and they stayed and they stayed and you were having to retrain people. You weren't having to break in the environment, you know, because every time somebody leaves, it hurts your culture. It hurts your small teams. It hurts your leads. You got to train, you know, all the money that goes into turnover is ridiculous. So that was the hardest thing I had for, you know, some of the board members to, to show them that, look, it's a long term game. It's not a short term. We're not just going to see the numbers increase. We're going to see it over time. And a lot of that stuff that, you know, Gina talks about with the culture, that stuff leads to retention of people who aren't part of this effort. It's just the whole organization. So uh, it just really, I think, made things better for everybody involved. It also made them train differently. So they now have formal trainers that I think I think our process helped actually make that happen, though it's been talked about for a long time. They have people that are set to train, um, and these people know how to do it in the multiple medias who have that multiple ways to see it. Like, talk about maybe some of that training real quick um, and how your training overall has just changed from doing this. Well, as you mentioned, um, it did help us finally get approved to have trainers. So the trainers... Um, they know all the functions in the facility, um, out in the manufacturing facility. So it's helped us, as Tiffany mentioned, do better with training, develop different types of charts, um, touchy-feely type stuff. So textures to help learn about the different <laughs> fabrics. That kind of touchy-feely. Um, yeah, touchy-feely, <laughs> like, you know, sensory type things. Um, because we have different types of fabrics, different textures, uh, different threads and things like that. So it's helped the training, the trainers that we have now just develop different ways, better ways. Um, like we've been talking about some people are more visual. So we may have charts. Um, some people like the step-by-step. -step, so we have that. Or sometimes we found that 
the trainee actually just writing the steps themselves the way they want to learn it has helped as well. So different ways. Um, the trainers have been also very flexible with schedules, as Tiffany mentioned. We have schedules that are sometimes three days a week um, to five days a week, depending on the hours. And because we work pretty much 21 hours a day right now, we're able to work with different schedules. So the trainers have adapted. You know, they want to make everyone successful that comes in. So they've been willing, you know, they'll work you know, eight to midnight, they'll work seven to 11 in the morning, whatever's needed. So it's, it's been a really good process. And the last thing I just want to add is through this process, um, the whole organization's noticed a, just a change in the way they lead. So Gina has been able to go through what we call person-centered leadership training. Um, we've been able to also train some of their new leads. So now they're taking their entire leadership process for everybody getting promoted and Grit and Flow is training them on how to be better inclusive leaders, um, how to do better job evaluations, how to do better interviewing that's compliant with the Americans with Disability Act. Um, we also just teach them about, um, you know, emotional intelligence. We, we've taken it to, with them, the benefits of this inclusion and then changing it to educating the entire company, including getting ready to do executive retreats. We'll be doing some like disc assessments about personality types and people working together. So um, it's just changed the whole way they look at things. And um, I'm just so proud that I got to be a part of uh, Penn. And um, yeah, you guys, if anybody needs a job, they got lots of openings. So I know our time's yes. up. Um, I'm gonna put their website and Gina, do you want me to put my email or yours? Um, both. both. Okay, I'll put all our stuff in here and um, we would be more than happy to have you guys come on out for a tour sometime. I think that's it. Thanks, Judy. Thank you, Gina. You were awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everybody. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, so I just have one last thing to say before we do questions. And I First of all, I think this has been a great meeting. I want to thank Tiffany, Gina, Mina, Kevin, and Jessica for really taking us on a fabulous tour. And I hope you realize how important this is, how, how we're, you know, with, through the hard work for the last four or five years of a lot of people, we're making a difference, but we're just at the tip. We're just at the tip in terms of creating a, an Orange County or a Riverside or a Southern California that has lots of positions open and is aggressively hiring from a diverse population. And really to make a difference, you need to look yourself in the mirror and say, am I willing to step up and do my part to help? Am I willing to take a little personal risk at work, find some other family members or other, other family people you work with who you know also have uh, um, family members that might benefit and start some activity in your company. To enable you, um, I put in the chat and right here at the bottom of this form is a link and I'll email it to you. I emailed it already to you, but it's a form we used it last year. We've updated it a little bit, but it's a way for you to volunteer and say, hey, I'm willing to help. How, how are you willing to help to make a difference? And I think with that, we're ready. So what will happen if you do provide that information is that I will sh be sharing it with Grit and Flow and NeuroTalent Works and also a third partner, Zavicon. Uh, and we'll figure out who already is working with someone or who is the best person for working with that particular company. And they will contact you and They'll start figuring out a way to work with you in the organization. Maybe you just introduce them to someone at the HR. Maybe uh, you have them come in and do a presentation. But they'll start figuring out a strategy with you for how within your company, within the culture, within the management chain, within where you stand in the organization, you can best make a change. And with that, we have time for questions. So I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to move us in to... Um, Everyone, why don't you move into, uh, where's my view? Gallery mode so I can see everyone. 
and um, see if we have any questions. You can raise your hand. Um, there might be a few in the chat, Tiffany or Jessica, if you want to look quickly. I know that there was one from uh, Pat, Patricia um, on uh, that that was asked in there and see if we have any questions. So Jessica, you want to just kick it off with uh, Pat's question? Yeah, so I think the question was about the business case. Um, so I know it was specifically to Mina and Kevin if the business case you put together for Capital Group could be shared. Um, Tiff and I and Judy even all have business case slides too, so we're happy to help you with that as well. But maybe I'll look to Kevin and Mina too. Sure. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, sorry, I have to come downstairs to help my son, so I'm at a different location but with the, with the laptop. So as far as the business case is concerned, I think the right type of business case really is the one that's tailored to your organization. Mm -hmm. What is the need of your organization and where does your organization stand in terms of culture and what is the most valuable for them in that phase? So the business case should be approached in that manner. And that's precisely why I, I don't think sharing one company's business case may, may suit another the other company's business case. However, a template could be useful. And I know um, you both shared you have a template. I'm also happy to share that Autism at Work playbook, which I yeah. used as the basis to create this business case. And then I can just give that outline skeleton template if that's useful. And, and just so you know, we've, we've previously had um, Neil from um, Microsoft who runs the Autism at Work uh, Roundtable. And he's, you may want to go back and look at the presentation he gave or the presentation that um, Jose gave from SAP. So there's some other resources that are available. But Mina, thank you. And yeah, that, that, um, that Autism at Work guide is, is really, playbook was really helpful. Um, other questions, raise your hand, put it in the chat, however you want to um, communicate. Salary. Salaries, okay. So I know, Sabag, you've had this question before in terms of, he has questions about what can you expect from a salary and also how to ask for specific salaries when you're getting hired? Well, I think when you look at the job description and when it's put out there, a company should give you a salary range for the job. That's the best procedure really for any company to go through. So you know the range. And then usually a company will have grades that they'll give you based on your experience. So neurodivergent or not, there should be no difference for your salary and what you're getting as any other candidate going in there, period. So um, I think as any person joining the workforce, we're teaching to have those conversations is important regardless of being neurodivergent or not. I know when you have careers that are um, more white collar, like the capital group, or you have more blue collar, like some of the jobs at Penn and then they have the white collar, some, some are salary, some are hours, some have benefits, don't have benefits. Those are all things you're going to have to walk, you know, your new hire candidate through regardless of ability level or anything else. So, but definitely the same expectations should be the same for everybody. Yeah, and what okay. I would oh, you go ahead. add something, sorry, Judy, really fast, is to do market research on the job role and the location because that matters in the salary range, especially in California, it is higher. So, um, if you're ever asked the question from an employer, always say that state that you did market research and this was the range that you saw for this similar role in this city or this state. Um, and that's what they're looking for in an answer to if they're asked, if you're asked. And then you know and so, your worth. <laughs> yeah, and Savag, it, it's good that you're thinking about it, right? It's good that you think about it and realize that it's a sensitive issue. So how you approach it um, the way Jessica and Tiffany suggested is, is really good. Um, there's a question from Sandy and her son is graduating from Cal State Fullerton in computer science this summer. 
and she wants to know where should he start looking for an internship or job? Yeah, so I just dropped it into the chat. On our webpage of resources, we have an entire section of companies with neurodiversity hiring programs. So that would be a good place to start. Um, I'll do a plug for Dell. They are, they just ran a program um, and I've heard really wonderful things about their program in IT. Um, and then of course, SAP and Microsoft um, and some of the other leading. But, but one of the things you might wanna think about is some of the employment readiness programs that we've all talked about. OCSG is doing Career Club. Jessica and Tiffany have talked about different things, but it's really important that they start thinking about soft skills, start thinking, uh, Kevin was talking about executive functioning. So you may want to just kind of do a personal assessment and say, hey, what, what kinds of skills do I need to learn? Also start looking at some of the jobs that are available. You may decide, hey, I need to get certified in a particular programming language where there seems to be lots of availability. So. Um, also be open to when you take your first job, it may not be, you know, you may want to go into game design while well, you may end up being a programmer in COBOL, you know, who knows? So, so you need you to- You probably don't even know what COBOL is, <laughs> too young. <laughs> they're still hiring people for that. So oh anyway, the, the point, the point being, you need to um, think about what language, what kind of programming you want to do. Things to think about is where where are there lots of opportunities and, and where is there going to be growth for you over the long run? Sandy, I also think you need to use your university. If your son or daughter has, I don't remember what it was, um, has yeah, navigated program. the university, there should be professors he has that he can ask for connections. He should use those. They know them. They'll be able to set them up with a great introduction saying, hey, and I don't know anything about your child. Um, they may blah, 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 but wow, this work they did is great or the way they saw connections was fantastic. Um, and the, we need to keep our colleges accountable for our children that are graduating. I have a son at Chapman. They better be ready to get him a job, you know, autistic or not, he deserves it. So we need to make sure they're saying, get our kids jobs too. And there's some other resources. Uh, one of the things that we've done is work with Department of Rehab and have them open up a um, organization down here, Evo Libre, who is up in Northern California and does a lot of placement in high tech. So um, they're now a resource down here. So there's some resources through DOR that you might want to do. Don't just assume, you know, I've been working with this group for a long time and there's a lot of First of all, it's great that it's a computer science major. It's a great major and there's lots of opportunities, but it's going to be work to find work and um, they need to be prepared because it's overwhelming. You know, you're, you're kind of like a deer in the headlights to have to try and figure out how do I find a job? How do I deal with all these online applications? How do I deal with the interview process? So realize that it's a new challenge and give give your child support, maybe through UCLA's Peers for Careers, there are a whole bunch of different programs that are out there now that could help them find employment. So um, realize that this is gonna be a, a major job and that um, you know they may need some help. Yeah, dude, if I can add, the importance of job readiness uh, is such a big jump, even for a neuro neurotypical going from college to the workforce, right? even more so for someone who's neurodivergent. And so even now start to prepare them for the, for, for the workforce, such as self-advocacy, have them to advocate for themselves. And that's key because that'll help them a lot when he, on the job to advocate for themselves, so. Thanks, Kevin. Um, someone was asking about scholar, uh, Savag, scholarships for autistic people to attain a higher degree. Any of you aware of um, and I'll, I'll just start off with this, that a lot of employers have um, tuition reimbursement programs. So if you do get employed, you might want to look into something like that. Um, Jessica and Tiffany, if you have any, or Kevin, Nina, anything, Gina, anything to add? I would just add that DOR does support um, even if you are in a job right now, if you have a case, if you don't open one with a counselor and tell them very specifically that you are in a job 
but you want to move up in your career to a next job that required these next skills to learn and what you need in order to learn those skills, if it's going back to school, be as specific as you can about what you need support in, and they do provide some funding to help you upskill to get to a next job and a next level. I'm glad you mentioned that, Jessica, the very good point. Just be very specific about exactly what you need. And that's true for anything from DOR and regional centers. The best that you can do is advocate for yourself or your child with really specific what they need to advance and be successful. Okay, I have a question for our audience. Any of you feel now motivated to um, think about your job and think about opportunities there? Did we did we get light the fire under any of you? Are you being shy? Well, I'm gonna guilt you into this at every meeting in the future. So <laughs> you need to start thinking about how you contribute. I know, I know everybody's busy and it's hard being a parent or it's hard being in school, but if, if you're a person on, on the spectrum or, you know, an individual, ask your parent, ask your friends, you know, make that a point of conversation, have that elevator statement like Kevin was saying, and use opportunities to promote hiring from a, a diverse population. I know that you're not alone and you know we're here I know Tiff too we're, we're here for the long haul so if it's not this year it's next year you know or another year we'll be here so there's a lot of work to do and we're here to help you so yeah no need to feel alone in it too. And I know as a parent sometimes you're not ready to turn it on at work and at home. I know it came time for me where and a lot of you I, I couldn't have done this professionally because I was living it daily. I can't even watch some shows that were, you know, autistic <laughs> stars. I was like, I love this. I don't want to watch the shows, you know, but then you come to a time where you can, you know, get to that thing and something will motivate you to make you want to dive in and do that. So it's okay to wait for that right time because you'll come on strong. I mean, and do it because it's going to be different in all of our lives based on the demands, you know, we've had to put into our children um, and everything else going on to it. So, you may have just, you know, put that little thing in your head and you'll keep looking for opportunities and one day it will spark and you'll be like, let's do this. So that day will come. So don't put pressure on yourself. You got a lot in your hands. Uh, I know. <laughs> we have, we th thank you. We have one last question for Jessica, Kevin, Amina, asking if there's any data entry or accounting positions available at Capital Group. One in San Antonio right now. <laughs> okay. Yes, I'm helping to source for it, actually. So um, please get in contact, yeah, with me. And Kevin, how about any other um, entry level or data entry positions? Um, right now, I only know of the one in San Antonio. There could be others, but again, um, our website uh, is public. And so our job postings are public, so you can always look there for that. But one thing you should think about is it it doesn't have, I, I think, Kevin, that's within your your overall neurodiversity at work program, but you have other jobs that are available and people shouldn't necessarily not apply um, to those. So is, is that correct? I mean, there's not only one job available at Capital Group today. There's quite a few jobs available, right? There's quite a few jobs. They're everywhere. <laughs> everywhere, different type yeah. of skill sets, so. Yes. But I think, I think they're asking though, Kevin and Mina, if they see a job that is open and they may be running by you guys, would that be okay? So you can maybe put it in with the um, hiring manager, the, you know, explain to them kind of the transition for the individual. Would that be something you'd be open to doing or, or Jessica? Yeah, right now, I, right now I would probably currently filter that through Jessica because we are engaging your talent works to kind of source that talent. Awesome. Thank you. That was a good idea. Well, I, it's almost nine o'clock. I want to, again, thank all of you for coming to this meeting. I especially want to thank 
Tiffany and Jessica for helping me put this wonderful evening together and Mina, Kevin and Gina for your the wonderful things you're doing all the time as well as uh, joining us today. Um, as I mentioned, this meeting was recorded, so you will be receiving a link to the recording as well as any links that uh, we shared today. So thank you. Thank everybody. you very much. <laughs> it's very informative. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Bye. <laughs>